we now bring you part two of the bubble culture, a continuation of the August 2013 studio session with Duran Dassu at the Blue Lotus Temple of Sound and Light, just down the road from Dr. Bruce's Levity Zone. In part one, we tackled the trends, economics, and purported transformational community of the festivals being held with increased frequency here on the U.S. West Coast and worldwide. Our experience of observing this scene and the archetypes of people who inhabit it is further elucidated next with an investigation of what is referred to as the entitlement generation. We also try to recall the features of what a real community is and compare it to these temporary autonomous zones. I pose a chilling final proposition. Does the festival scene actually power the machine? That is, the machine that many of us want to ditch before it runs the planet into a ditch. So we were discussing the trajectory of what, for lack of a better word, we can call the entitlement generation, Mm -hmm. specifically in its uh, neo-tribal, psychedelic, West Coast Mm -hmm. culture. Rendition. You know, in the current version of, you know, the the, the rebels without... Without a cause. Without a cause (laughs) or a clue. And and you're a very, very good barometer... You've seen them come through here, this place, and how would you characterize them? Well, they they tend to define themselves fundamentally as counterculture, but at the same time, they're steeped in every part of modern consumer society. Mm -hmm. So they're driving to the Occupy movement in their, their V8 automobiles, yeah. And buying their cappuccino on the way and talking on their AT&T iPhones. Right, exactly, you know. But in their minds, they're actually making deep sociocultural and political and consciousness statements. One of the words that gets bandied around regularly is our community and this idea of building this great rainbow tribe of community that Mm -hmm. transcends all of the limitations of the old world but i just don't see that you know my actual experience with most of these people has been again for lack of a better word tribe has been of extremely entitled you know self-possessed you know Mm -hmm. just the self seems paramount and i don't understand how when you're so obsessed with self how do you build community with that? Mm. You know, even though that's a desired and stated goal from so many people that have passed through this orbit over the last 12, 13 years that I've been here. You know, there's mm. such a strong expressed desire to form like the neo community and the neo tribe. You made a, a statement earlier which was sort of rang true for me, which was that they are making a statement. So perhaps that's the the thing by the way they, what they say and what they say on their phone calls or their texts or tweets or their Facebook page or the way they dress or the festivals they show up for or whatever the art they do. The prime thing that this generation is doing is making statements, but they're not actually doing anything much more than making a statement. They're not building infrastructure. They're not doing research. They're, for the most part, not building products. And they feel maybe that the statement alone is the value, but the statements go into the ether. The the fashions go out of style. The paintings get subsumed by more paintings. The YouTube video gets no no more viewers. The, The Facebook post vanishes after 60 comments. It gets washed away like sand. And so the the statement-making generation, the statements feed social networks, they feed media culture, uh, but they actually produce nothing in the end. Yeah, because for a bunch of self-proclaimed counterculture types, the obsession with conformity and acceptance makes very little sense. 
If you are genuinely counterculture, then stop caring so much about what other people think. Mm. Because uh, okay. through the course of human history, generally the majority has not been correct, you know, until a genuine counterculture type shows up with a new perspective. And a general counterculture character figure tends to be highly unpopular to the point that they get nailed up, stoned, ostracized. So in some sense, the tribe or whatever the indigo generation of the crystal kids or whatever they are, because they're also raised in an environment of political correctness, which has its sort of nasty outbound side, they don't value or accept criticism or the weird, truly countercultural individual that shows up and tells them, look, 90% of what you just uttered makes no sense, even from a syntactical basis, <laughs> and let alone any ideas that are consistent that can be acted upon. There's nothing there. There's no content. And of course, that's a true situation in a lot of the cases. It's something that then the, the teller of that truth, yeah. instead of being valued of uh, in any way is then ostracized and turned away. So truth can't enter the equation. But true of analysis and evaluation of the value of actions and the value of words and the statements being made. One of the things I've noticed is the delusional bubble building. So the delusional bubble building will start with some state that usually comes from the culture, from the ether, and then people build a pattern of well, then that means that, and then this means this, and because that's true, and it's something which isn't true, builds upon the next domino, which is, well, then that's true, and then therefore, you know, lizard people run the world, or <laughs> or the, the, the twin towers were knocked down by the U.S. government by contractors, or, or commercial airliners are supplemented at night by secret commercial airliners that dump chemical into the sky for some unknown reason and that this this is happening all the time and here's a doctored up photoshop picture to prove it and so then this goes on and on and people spin this stuff on and on and on and no one's there to challenge it and if they are they're ostracized they're attacked because they're being you know unfair or not allowing free speech or you know the political correctness gone crazy so no objective thinking is permitted and objective thinking and criticism and asking for facts and asking for proof is considered a social faux pas or at worst it's considered you're a bad and evil person for demanding a shred of proof for these compounded statements that lead up to this bizarre worldview. Yeah, a wise man I met early on in my countercultural or subculture experiences told me that of all the people you will meet in these fringe communities, realize that there's a small percentage of them who are genuine rebels, who genuinely are here because they have tried the systems that exist and reached a state of deep dissatisfaction with it and chose alternate pathways and decided to explore new ways of interacting with themselves and their environment and their reason for being and you know, all of the essential human desires. But there's a larger portion of the fringe which is just made up of people who are not here by choice. They are here because they are dysfunctional and they cannot function in, for lack of a better word, the real world. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just here because this is the only place that will have them. Because in this place, there is no collective memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything is transitory. It's just one more festival, one more party, one more mm -hmm. event. It's just one more experience, you know. There is no archival catalog of it versus real tribes where there is this continued bank of wisdom mm -hmm. that is built and accumulated over generations. And you decide what's in the canon and what's not yeah. after a while. You know, except in this festival culture and particularly, you know, what we're talking about, about 
California and West Coast festival culture, there is no memory. Mm. Nothing lasts. You know, they're just... It's almost like each one of those festivals is like a drug trip that you come back from and you're on some sort of a high and then you, you've you learned nothing because you've not integrated it and you're back in your schmucky life. You're back in your life that you would want to face realities about. Yeah, and all the languaging is a hodgepodge of these little understood spiritual paths, but everyone knows all the catchphrases. Like, for example, recently, uh, some people of my acquaintance, there was one person in the group being extremely difficult to deal with Mm. on any basic human level of good manners, good behavior, community spirit, sharing, caring, any of the things that actually define a community. And in the real world, probably this person would have been deeply ostracized. Mm -hmm. There would have been a feedback from the environment that this behavior of yours is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. But in this bubble culture, (laughs) the advice from at least a few people was, oh, so-and-so is having a really hard time. We should all be really compassionate. And I had a conversation with with one of the people involved going, I don't think you understand what the word compassion means. Because that's not the appropriate, Mm -hmm. that is not the appropriate response or languaging for the situation. What you're saying is compassion is, actually what you're saying is we should just accept whatever nonsense this person is throwing our way Mm -hmm. because we're all too scared of confrontation to actually address what's wrong with the core behaviors. Instead, we're converting this into an internalized process of, oh, we need to be compassionate and just swallow everything. And, you know, that's just one example. That's one good example. You know, know, um, Joan Didion, who's this wonderful author of the American scene for the last 50 years, she spent some time in the Haight-Ashbury, and by the time she was there... Uh, she was older than most of the people, and she wrote this short story called Slouching Toward Bethlehem, and it's a totally nails, and this is 1967, right, 65, 67, and she totally nails it because she said, basically, what's happened here in the hate is children who are not yet formed as adults reject what their parents are giving them come to so sort of build a new life but what they built is an adolescent mostly dysfunctional dependent on money from outside to pay their bills for the babies that were born in the hate you know in that time period you're talking absolutely incompetent parenting you know weird diets and all justified on making a new life or a new scene or it's all about love or whatever but the people who are in the hate they have no life experience whatsoever. They're pampered kids from the suburbs that just rocketed there with no means of support and no practical understanding of what it meant to run a business, do a store, do a community. And they're also taking a lot of drugs. And so some of them have spun out. Some of them are crashed. And, and they're all in this enormous great soup, this great smelly dysfunctional pile. And at the end, you know, she basically says, I don't know where this is going, but there's nothing here. And of course, the mythology about those times, I mean, this was the person who was writing this, the center. She was writing as a reporter would write about it, but with a, a woman's approach and a really bear all truths and tell all truths. And in some sense, when you hear about, say, a young girl, she's in the hate, she's making some kind of crazy green drink. Like, everyone's supposed to live on this new vegan diet, including the little kids, which is completely mad, because these little kids are getting malnourished. And then there's the guy crashed out in the corner who just showed up three days ago. And, and the, the, the words that are coming out of the young girl sound exactly like the words coming out of the entitlement generation. They're exactly the same language. So we're talking, you know, 1965, six. How long ago is that? That's almost 50 years ago. 
Isn't that scary? Isn't that <laughs> stunning? And you could pluck that girl out of that apartment in the hate and put her down in the modern time, and there would have been no evolution. Her dysfunction would just go straight into and, and be understood and recognized. She'd have to learn how to use a mobile phone, but that would be the only change. Yeah, and in this case, the, the peer group to look for conformity clues is available through a digital device that you, you have access to mm-hmm. 24-7. I was watching some TV show the other day with Douglas Rushkoff on it. Mm-hmm. And one of the questions that the host of the show asked him was something about cell phones. And Rushkoff was pointing out that even 15 years ago, the only people who needed 24-7 access to communication were doctors or, mm-hmm. you know, people in, you know... The, like, pa- the pager culture. Yeah, you know, yeah. like... They were like emergency response people or or people who worked at high-level nuclear facilities. They were the only people who actually required that level of always-on connectivity. But in this 15-year period, Hmm. everybody is on 24-7 and is constantly bombarded with these short attention span Mm-hmm. little the snippets of Pavlovian conditioning yeah, yeah you know and but there's nothing of value being transmitted and so you your whole day is defined by that Facebook social network post that you put on that got 30 replies and now you feel valuable or valued and the next day it's forgotten and so what happened was you created something that interrupted 30 other people. They interrupted themselves to reply, to feel part of something that then vanished. And there's nothing produced except, you know, a tick in the stock value of Facebook because there's more of us pouring our life energy. And one of the things that was pointed out and by somebody I, I respect in the Valley was, yeah, all these companies are built by stealing the paid and unpaid and family and spare time of people. They have thefted all this time and energy from other enterprises to to build their net worth. Volunteer workforce of hundreds of millions of people have thefted all that to create their corporate stock value. And and, and that's been the pattern for the last 10, 12 years in the in the internet startup businesses. How can we steal employee time from other ventures and family time, how can you take the time completely ad hoc without any due recompense and build our value? So it's a huge snookering exercise of <laughs> convincing us to pour our life energy into into this thing. Yeah, and, and the raw material, you know, the, the clay out of which all this is molded is everybody's need to be validated so much, you know, of mm-hmm. this externalization of always looking outside to be told that what you're doing has value. And yes, in the real world, that is how things work. But this level of social network or festival culture mm-hmm. valuation, it's not it's really thing. valuation. It's just like a momentary nod given by somebody else, which you can use to pump up your own sense of self and, yeah. you know, build on that. Like I was talking to a couple of people recently who, you know, who get most of their passion from building chill spaces at these festivals, mm. as in just places where people can go hang out. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, you know... The chill the, space comes down. You know, like, where is, the, where is the value where is in the that? Value? You know, and I don't just mean from a monetary standpoint, but, mm-hmm. you know, what's it adding up to? It's just another place for people to confirm their UFO hypotheses and, mm-hmm. you know, reconfirm their, so maybe you know, it's, their deep conspiracy theories and pat each other on the back for how mm-hmm. cool they are that... 
they're not part of the system and that they can basically, you know, exist outside of it. But, you know, in the end, there's only a handful of people in all of this festival culture actually generating anything of value, as in actually making Mm -hmm. anything that has a tangible value. The rest of them are surviving with odd jobs and by, you know, sitting in a trim circle for one grower or another. And that's all going away. And that's all gone away at this point anyway. You know, that that, that little economic fantasy bubble has it's also reached its peak. You know? There were some visitors a year ago, and one of them was a telemarketer in a horrible cubicle circumstance. And the other guy was installing phone services for some big baby bell or something. And I looked at them and I thought, you know, what a terrible circumstance. So at least they were they were questing towards some kind of higher meaning in life. But most of the young people who are stuck in those kind of jobs, they just go get pissed drunk on the weekend and they have lots of sex if they can or anything to break the monotony and the nightmare, the fact that they're trapped in jobs with no future that just barely pay enough that they can have for the, the one apartment. It's like hopeless. They're stuck in that level. And the U.S. economy is now in a state where in, in the old days, you came out of school, you got a job, you were up learning the mobile, you did your thing in your 40s and 50s, and then you popped out into retirement. Now, uh, two-thirds of the young people out of school can't get meaningful work. One-third are fully unemployed. And then the midlife people are being laid off and they've gone through eight to 10 million foreclosures and divorce and stuff. And the older people have to keep working. So they're retaining those jobs longer because they don't have enough to actually retire. So the whole system is jammed pipes. The pipes are broken. So in the background of this comes this entitlement generation that were raised during the false boom of the year 2000 to the year 2008 which is all on borrowing and debt and war spending. And the internet boom of the 90s, which is a little bit more real, but they were raised in these false bubble periods. And now that we're in this disturbed, long-term chronic unemployment period, you have this background of the hopeless generation, a generation stuck in those horrible jobs that has no prospect. So in some sense, you know, this, the festival culture is their validation that they're not totally hopeless, but in truth they are. Because, you know, it doesn't matter what college they went to and how much student loan debt, and that they put their parents in such debt that the house was foreclosed, and that was a lot of the cases. The parents gave everything for these kids, including the viability of their own retirement. The ultimate entitlement is that your provider gave so much to you that they destroyed them which has happened in a lot of these cases. But these kids don't acknowledge that. I, I would doubt if they acknowledge that. They're, they're part of that. In the old days, they would be supporting their parents if the parents were in trouble. In a true community, they would be working and, 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 and housing their parents. But that won't happen. So it's a vicious cycle. And in some sense, in, as we move into the 20 teens and the thing gets deeper, they say the longer it runs, the chronic unemployment and the, the chronic creation of an underclass that used to be the middle class. That so many people have fallen out of the middle class into this underclass. It's actually a new class of poor people. So what do you do? What are the alternatives? And where does it go? Well, it potentially goes where you get a lot of very angry, highly dysfunctional, highly non-prepared for any kind of life people that are now really falling into poverty. They're starting to form families. The families are formed in very bad circumstances. They only have rental properties. They can only do that. They're constantly moving. The festival scene provides the validation, but it wears out after a while when they're in their mid-30s. And that's worn out, and and they can't afford it. And they're now in truly a long-term poverty. That's one channel, potentially, for a group of this generation. And it's not a happy picture because they don't have the tools to be entrepreneurial. They don't have the tools to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and figure it out, figure out how to create an independence in the system as it is, you know, become a master cabinet maker, start an app company, you know, finally get that, oh, I have to produce a base under me. 
I can't just make statements and be on social networks and somehow the bills are paid and their parents will go. Their parents will go into poverty at the time that they will run out of support from the parents, you know, as the system tumbles down. But you're going to end up with a lot of anger, with a lot of angry people who don't have any facility. They'll just be angry, but they will have no no real basis to make a revolution because they'll have no answers. And at the same time, you have this vicious cycle of celebrity culture. So in some sense, it's like the end of empire, where value is the statement you make in the little bully pulpit you carve for yourself, and celebrity, and even if it's a nano-celebrity, a tiny celebrity. So you put all your energy into that. And meanwhile, you're not putting your energy into the things that really matter. So as you get older and older, and we talked about our mutual friend, where he arrives here at the age of 20, and now he's probably 23, and the, that clock is ticking. And I've told him, you know, several times you must acquire a skill. You need mentorship, go back to a school, you need something to put under yourself. When your clock is ticked down and you're 30, 35 years old, I have another friend who's just turned 35, and he's been in that cycle now for 15 years, and he said, now I know that I have few years left to actually do something. He said, if I'm going to be a great graphic artist, i got to get serious about it. i got to study what it means. If I'm going to make products, I really have to do it. I'm 35. You know, it'll take five years to build a real business, and I'll be 40, and then I've got to make that business pay. If I wanted to have a family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's almost like the wise ones run out of the the party circuit and the festival circuit, and if they pop out blinking into the real world and decide I've got to make something of myself, if they do it by 35, they might have a shot. You know, our life paths were different. We both emigrated here from the empire, me from Canada, you from India. We knew what it took to actually get to this freaking place and the hoops you had to jump through and et cetera, et cetera. So we we sort of land here with the immigrant's idea of self-reliance, innovation agency, counting your pennies or your rupees or your Canuck bucks or whatever and, and building yourself up. When I came here and I finished graduate school, I said, I have like $2,500 to my name. And I know that that would provide five months of living. So I've got to get to it because I have no other source of support. And I need to get off my F1 visa and on onto a a work type thing because when that runs out I'm out of here so it's like this big motivator and it was that period of time of total uncertainty and I found my first job and they agreed to get me my sponsor you yeah. yeah and my god you know for a period of time it was like all the effort I had taken to get to the United States and to get to California where I knew my future was was just about to go out the window I was, it was totally at risk and you meet Americans and kids that have no idea of the the fortune they have to be born into this world and and have everything handed to them. So, of course, they don't work. They don't value it. They don't value their lives. They don't value the opportunities around them. They don't even see the opportunities around them. Yeah, you know, and particularly this subgroup that we're talking about, they don't quite seem to realize that to be a counterculture be really active in a counterculture, you have to run counter to the culture. Mm. You cannot be consuming it hand over fist at the same time. As you profess to be against it. Yeah, and you know, you cannot find this missing sense of community if you are inherently self-obsessed and selfish. That feeling of community is only going to come from actually looking at a larger sense of self. And that has to transcend your body. It has to start including other people and other creatures and the environment. I mean, it has to actually ripple out outside of, you know. It can't be about yourself and your pleasures and your... Yeah, exactly. It can be about, oh, I need another iPhone. I need another iPhone so that I can make a bunch of silly Facebook posts every day and be fully connected Mm -hmm. to my tribe. That doesn't actually cut it on any level. That accomplishes nothing. Accomplishes nothing. 
And so it's almost like the rise of the digital medium is like an enormous sponge that is sopping up all this attention and promoting the idea that this is something that's being done and it's not. There's nothing being accomplished through the digital medium. Almost nothing. In the sense that making statements to it and everyone likes your statement and therefore it's changing the world. It's a simulacrum of reality. If you were instead at a town hall meeting where the local townsfolk are rising up against the punitive taxes of the landowner and you're taking the risk of holding your pitchfork up and shaking it and saying, we need to throw off this punitive, taxing, absent, non-caring bastard up on the hill. And then the likes you're getting are the, the shouts and screams of the townsfolk who now have to make a plan and a plan in which some people will be casualties. And there's a consequence from the larger world and there's got to be an action plan after we do burn the manor house down. There's an action plan of how do we keep the king's army back? How do we make the local rebellion work? And then we still have to get the crop in. And we need the skills of, of the stable hand that may run from the manor house and be gone. And he's, he's the only one that shoes the horses. So it's an eminently practical, true organization of making that statement and the follow-through. Yeah. Otherwise, it's it's just opinions and words. Or as Penny just said, it's just all masturbation. Yeah. You know, basically. (laughs) Basically. (laughs) Because unless you do something, you know, because this this plane, you know, the material plane is about doing. This Mm. is the doing plane. Yes, it's also the feeling plane and the thinking plane, but those only have value when they translate into doing something. If it's just, oh, I had this great feeling, mm. it doesn't mean anything. So you then know, if you the, manifest it in something, you know, create something from it. So this comes back to the festival scene, in that, and this is why the festival scene is actually really dangerous. The festival scene is like a Facebook post. It's just like a Facebook post, because you build these temporary chill zones put up this thing and you have your sonic space and your whatever and your marketplace and whatever and that's all going on and then it's totally unsustainable it just disappears in three four days it's vanished so the people that are in it think they're in a new world they think this is the world new world we're building what it's not it's like a facebook post it's very much like a digital experience totally ephemeral totally digital Totally about statement. There's no infrastructure left behind. Yeah, I mean, just even like, you know, let's use the mother of all festivals at this point, Burning Man. Mm. You've been there many times. I've been there many times. I stopped going more than 10 years ago. The last time I went was 2001. Mm. You know, and I'd been for seven years before that. So I reached a certain point of uh, saturation with the whole thing where I came to this realization that it is the ultimate temple of disposable consumerism. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that the people who put effort into it don't put in great effort. But at the end of the line, it is transitory and an immense amount of resources. Carbon burn. And and carbon burn. All the things that we that we supposedly stand against. And it's quantifiable because you could add up all the vehicles, their miles, and all the packaged goods and all that crap, and you could probably come up with a number of how many millions of gallons of fuel, thousands of tons of just of waste, of garbage. And if you piled it up on the playa of all the 20-plus years of Burning Man, you would find... An enormous citadel of consumer trash and fuel drums and all that would be there. It would probably be you know, a cubic mile of crap it could be stacked there to represent what was used up to make that experience happen. Yeah, just bicycles alone. <laughs> just, just bicycles. Just bicycles alone. <laughs> if you just think of 
How many bicycles are purchased? Many left there. Are left there. You know, at the end of it all, what does it really mean? Like, okay, speaking for myself, yes, I had some very deep visionary experiences. Mm-hmm. But to be frank, those experiences would have been as valid had I gone there when nobody was there. Mm. Because it really was the environment, the, the, desert. the actual desert environment and the curvature of the earth and <clears throat> all the natural elements that provided that level of visionary experience. And the rest of it was just a really fun party. Yeah. And you have nothing against parties, you know, that was great. But no part of it was sustainable on any level. And these are the same people who essentially feel like they are changing the world by doing this. Mm. And yet they come back from the playa to their cubicle at Google, which is another big monster that's consuming human attention span and and human hopes and dreams in a lot of ways. And they work and work and work so that they can have their playa time, their playa life the next year. And so, in fact, Burning Man is a huge blow-off point of dream expectation of the frustration of the modern world. But because it's a blow-off point, it permits those people to go and be in that cubicle culture for the next year, for the next 11 months and two weeks. And therefore, it feeds and serves the matrix. It feeds and serves that culture. So all of these festivals perpetuate in a way because they're less willing to say, I'm going to change my work environment. I'm going to change the bullshit meetings that I was just in or the nonsensical political statements and I'm going to fight against to make a better world here. No, because they go to the festival and they feel good and it allows them to get their rocks off on that and then they come back and they knuckle down in this horrible life and they don't have the energy to change it. So the festival scene is perpetuating the dysfunction in society. The other hand, let's rewind the clock to ancient Greece where you had the Eleusinian mysteries. So everyone in their lifetime would go once to this place and who knows what happened, but for 1500 years or thereabouts, it was this place that was totally transformative of human lives. And when people came back, they were different. And this was run by some kind of secret organization that kept it secret because it was a mystery and it was transformative and it probably helped create the modern world for better or for worse. And so there was an example of something that was designed to infuse the society with powers, energies, insights, whatever, that would go back. The Hajj is like that for Muslims. You know, many of them, they come back from the Hajj and they're, you know, they're transformed. So there's examples of, quote unquote, festivals or places or designed experience to transform society. But what we're perhaps concluding is that Burning Man on down and the rest of the festivals they're not doing, they're not delivering. They're not doing that. No, they're not, because if the audience just treats everything in this rapid fire, short attention span, mm. ADD mm-hmm. kind of world we live in, if everything just boils down to a series of lights and colors and rhythmic sequences, you know, you've lost the thrust of it. Like, I remember a conversation I had with a couple of the visionaries of this scene. And I found it astounding because they were discussing their experiences at one of the larger festivals. And every part of their experience, they were able to catalog from a pharmacological standpoint. Hmm. As in, oh yeah, I felt like that. And when I feel like that, I like to take a little bit of this because then that helps you... Hmm feel a little bit better this way and then I'm coming down from that then I take this thing Mm. like it was all like the entire thousands of years of shamanic knowledge and culture was being I don't want to say refined or distilled because it's not it wasn't either of those things but it was being for lack of a better word dumbed down Mm. to just a series of biochemical switches Mm. you know without any context for 
an actual one-to-one relationship with the cosmos. Mm-hmm. It was all just switches. I mean, it was just toggle switches, you know. Total self-indulgent. I need to feel good. And here's how I manage my pharmacopoeia. My little fragile glistening gray matter brain. Here's how I crank it and tweak it in order to keep it feeling at its peak goodness or whatever. And that's, of course, you know, where addiction starts. Because now you're addicted to a self-indulgent pattern that you must feel good at all times. So you must have the adulation of your fans or you must have the right pharmacopoeia and do all these things in order to be in your groove and therefore bad information or disturbing things or quote unquote the real world that comes in is like bad vibes and man you know don't load that on me i block it out you know of course this went back to the 60s and the beatles song uh, come together where they talk about the guy that has hair down below his knees and if you embrace him you feel his disease And he said, I know you, you know me, and you must follow me and come together. And it's a parody, a a pillorying of this kind of personality where, you know, this smelly, feel good, I'm right, you must follow me. He has no money. He must be good looking because he's so hard to see. You know, (laughs) that's the Beatles taking on this emergent personality type of total entitlement and total dishygiene, disresponsibility, this character. And they were seeing it rise. And so was Alan Watts was seeing this type of personality arise. And I don't know what happened to those people. But what we're saying here is that type of personality is alive and well in this modern scene. But they have, they have access to technology so they can actually get an audience for whatever they want to put out, however cockamamie and you know, crazy it is, they can get even more validation than the the guy with his hair down to his knees walking down the hate carrying the sign. You know. Yeah, now the, you, have an, you have an audience of millions. Mm. And no one to say no, no one to criticize, no one to take to task. You know, because that's one of the strange offshoots I, again, say is a, it's a strange bastard child of the West Coast New Age movement, which at this point has somehow morphed into you know, morphed and whittled itself down to to some very dysfunctional traits, which is nobody's open to criticism because like you know there's phrases now which mean nothing. What are you doing? Oh I'm holding space for that. That means I'm not, that's actually another way of saying I'm not doing anything. I've carved a little compartment in my head where given a 50-50 chance of whether that could happen or couldn't happen, I would prefer it did. That's it. You know, I'm holding space for it. I'm holding space. You know, it doesn't mean you're doing anything active to make it so. You're just holding space. And... You know, other such nonsense like, well, I'm speaking my truth, mm. which has kind of become a umbrella for I can say whatever the hell I want. And what I say has as much value as what you say, because I'm speaking my truth. Mm. And you can't tell me that your truth is better than my truth. But as a scientist... You know that's bullshit. All di- truths are not equal. The yeah. disease of relativism. Yeah. yeah. You know. All things trivial become important and all things important become trivial. So where are we going with the conversation? So we're, we're categorizing a syndrome, a disease, a culture. We, we've seen this culture grow and sort of flourish and bubble up. We think since the 60s, it may have happened earlier, but certainly since the 60s, wave upon wave. What happened to those previous generations that got into the cocktail of, I must feel good, it's my, you know, my truth, no responsibility in the world, I mean, no no action plan, poor parenting in a way, no skill set, entitlement, personality. What happened to those that were in that state in the 60s when they got into the 1970s and suburbia and the me generation hit? 
you know, what happened to these people when they turn 30, 40, 50, 60 years old? Because they infuse society. Did they somehow get religion? Did they become stockbrokers? Did they go back and get retrained? Did they... I think all, all of the above, you know. I think all of the above. I mean, in the 70s, probably a bunch of them did focus on the next phase of pharmacology again, mm-hmm. you know, and shifted to a whole other range of substances. And yeah, they shifted to cocaine. You know, and, which yeah. led to the all the excesses of... So some yeah. of them became total true victims. I mean, truly wrecked. Yeah. I, they crashed I mean, and burned. I would think so. You know? I mean, mm-hmm. just, just like when I think of the people I met approximately 15 years ago in kind of the second wave of the San Francisco techno-psychedelia heyday mm-hmm. in the, mid, mm-hmm. the early to mid-90s. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of peaked around 99, or, you know, around the turn of the millennium. There are lots of casualties there. Lots of casualties, lots of people who fried their nervous systems in one fashion or another. Loads of them who crashed and burned, some who went back to school and restarted their whole life in a different fashion. Mm-hmm. You know, lots of women got married and had babies and became mommies and moved off into suburban landscape. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's not that many people left standing. Right. So really, so this is then a phase that people go through. But it's possibly a phase that is exacts a high cost. Because, say, from the age of 15, 16, 17 to into their 30s, they're in a bubble. As we've talked about this bubble community. So they're in this bubble. And what do they gain? They must, they must gain something from the bubble. But what's lost, neither you or I was in such a bubble in our 20s and 30s. We were working our asses off. You know, we were immigrating. We were in high tech. We were in yeah, no, schools. I, and you know, I was definitely briefly in, in the briefly bubble. Briefly in the bubble. You know, but, it, but I was still always too much of a critical thinker to slip in too deep because I started finding the anomalies in the, mm. in the scene much, much quicker than I was subsumed or consumed by it. But for those who threw themselves utterly into that scene, I mean, the you know the example, several people who've written to me that, you know, they were in that scene and they did have some incredible insights. They did see stuff that the, the limb of the cosmos, you know, they did see that. The great practical joke that nature seems to put on us is that whether we do this through spiritual practice or medicine practices, and we see this incredible openings, we see the openings, and then we're thrown down, and we're thrown back to where it now becomes a cartoon film reel, or becomes a preciously held moment. But the reality of our lives are that we can't integrate that moment. That thing becomes, for some, this bully pulpit on which they pound because they feel they've, you know, they're now in a state where they're applying it to all visions of reality and theories and conspiracy theories and you know we find those people that go go crazy or as robert forte describes he says you're expanded in consciousness and you have this opening but for many you come back from it and then the ego grabs onto that and expands tremendously like the inflationary expansion of the universe and you become this angry, delusional, you become totally expanded that way. So it, it's like a bicycle pump that you then suck that energy and create basically a huge distortion, a huge problematic, grotesque distortion of that experience. And the universe as well. There's another monkey that that took the elixir and then with all their inbuilt tendencies, distorted it into into something grotesque and is now foisting it upon the world. We have the birth of religions over that kind of behavior. You know, Scientology on down, and Mormonism and on down to the so-called mainline religions seem to have been spawned out of some kind of initiation, some kind of true pure opening and then total corruption by the by the founder into something grotesque. 
But but they all manage to build because I've been asking myself this question for years and years, you know, about what defines community, what mm-hmm. actually makes a community, and you know, in, in my understanding of it, it's generally shared mutual self-interest. Mm-hmm. Be that for a spiritual reason, or be that for a financial reason, or be that because of a genetic, like a blood relation system. Mm. You know, those are what define, you know, one of those three things or some combination of those three things is what makes a community. But in the case of the the group we're talking about, none of those three Mm. actually exist, you know, because there's only a handful of people actually making any money out of it. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is below subsistence level living for the 95% of festival goers. There may be an elite 5% who are actually actually generating, whether it's from ticket sales or drug sales or or live painting, you know, whatever it is from DJing or performing, you know, that's such a small percentage. And even that, even if you look at that 5% in there, there's only a handful of people who actually get paid anything of substantial value. Mm. There's loads of second tier and third tier and fourth tier performers and support crew, etc., etc. Because they paid peanuts. Because they're all there to try to, you know, establish their name, make their statement, some fame. They're after the celebrity thing, some of them. You know, they're they're doing it to, you know, get in the door. But really they're Again, they're putting huge effort into something that's probably not going to pay back. Yeah, and but you know, my my point was that those are not building blocks for communities. Mm. You know, that's a party scene. It's a you party know, I mean, scene. it's ultimately it's not different from Studio Fifty Four in. Except Studio Fifty Four is a real business. Yeah, but yeah. but for lots of people who are there, in their minds, it was this community and you know, right. it was a whole scene and all of that, but. You know, me and a couple of friends have joked about over the years. The one thing we're good at doing as a community is throwing parties. Mm, mm -hmm. That is the extent of where the community comes together and all forces rally and all the synchronization happens, you know. Mm. You know, we're we're pretty good at getting some musicians together, getting a sound system together, finding a venue, plugging it all in, arranging for some kind of ticketing structure or some kind of scenario to justify and cover the basic costs of it. And that's it, you know. That's the community it. doesn't even apply as far as breaking down the event. It vanishes, it dissipates into the ethers once once the peak experience is over, because yeah. ultimately that is what everyone is chasing, is this it's this strange mix of consumerism and shamanic psychedelia, which is just kind of nuts because life cannot be a series of peak experiences like the peaks only make sense when contrasted with with the valleys Mm -hmm. you know you cannot being ecstatically happy all the time is nonsensical if you don't have a couple of down days you know if you don't have something to contrast that with it's like if you you sweat and toil and build your little life and you feel you worked an honest year and you want a peak experience, you go to the, the festival and it's earned. And you come back and do your honest work and put in your gardens and till your soil. I was just in Ojai and I met with this group and they asked me, you know, we want to establish like an advertising agency somehow that serves good in the world or maybe the counterculture and everything. And I said, well, one business plan, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is even viable, is go out to all these little producers, these clothing manufacturers, these people who make, you know, cocoa powder with mesquite energy things, and they, they sell ones and twosies and they go to the festivals and everything, and basically find the best ones, the ones that are actually responsible. Most people who are actually making something are already, and upgrade them. 
get them to understand subscription models so people can order the chocolate powder and get it delivered every every month do fantastic media for them instead of their little youtube video do professional promotion of their business fulfillment uh, and create an economic network of ley lines between the competent groups and create an actual marketplace an actual agora that's functional so that these people can be lifted you know, now they're really full time it really is paying their families bills and now they can devote their time to creating a new line of clothes instead of all the grunt work somebody else has centralized all that and you have economic power in the community that is sustainable and courses through one set of veins so that that was a proposal for them but they'd have to be very careful the people that they chose that's the thing you know this entire scene is so fundamentally dysfunctional mm. in terms of real world stuff again you know like oh you've got a business do you have a business license no mm. do you have a tax id number no you know i mean you, you know do you have do a you, bank account no you, <laughs> you actually know, the, the number of like, the number of things that are you know that you just look at and you're like you have not even place yourself in the trajectory for success mm. even if you get a success like for example i was talking to one of my clients actually who shall remain nameless, nameless. <laughs> about a media product we were designing for them and in the conversation came up oh yeah if we could you know put the pro- put the media product on youtube and we could get hundreds of thousands of hits there'd be so much money made from the advertising in reality i think if you get a million hits i think you get 1200 dollars mm. i think something like that but in either case it's peanuts in the... either case it is peanuts by any real industry standard and of course the person who you know i had this conversation with hadn't done the basics of hooking up their youtube channel to the advertising module mm. so even if they got a billion hits they would not see a cent from it because they had not actually set up the pipeline for success of course dear listener you may be asking yourself isn't dr bruce a pretty frequent follower of these very same festivals he is calling into question I may be masquerading as that proverbial black kettle as I must admit I really savor my time in the multi-hued bubbles of burning man and the other shindigs while in that bubble I feel it is my mission to try to reach out especially to younger audience members to excite them about some of the things that turn me on science tech and the wonder of our existence thus i am trying to inject my bit of transformation into the transformational festivals all that said i feel we should heed duran's real warning bells about the largely unrealized and unrealizable promise of this scene that is perhaps built on happenings from the fabled but failed 1960s hate ashbury Dubberator provided the tracks for this studio session and again for the cover art Jacob Amon layered text onto a photo taken by Penny Slinger visit us on the web at www.levityzone.com for all the rest of the podcasts and make a contribution of your own art text or a question that you would have us take up here in the zone Ashes. There's no tech support, no.